I remember the day I met my husband, Marcus Daly. I was only 18 years old. My father, a mine supervisor, allowed me to tag along on a mine inspection. Marcus Daly, a respected miner, was with us. I fell behind father and Mr. Daly. As I started down the steep incline to the mine, I hurried to catch up, going faster and faster, until I realized that I was about to tumble down the path head over heels. At that moment, Mr. Daly, who saw my predicament, reached out to stop me. I fell into his arms and laughed to hide my embarrassment. After this rather abrupt introduction, Marcus became a regular visitor to our home. Soon he was asking father for my hand in marriage. Marcus and I were married in Salt Lake City in 1873. During our years together, Marcus could make me blush by suggesting that I had literally fallen into his arms that day at the mine. My husband was an incredible man. He was born into an Irish tenant farming family just before the Great Potato Famine of 1845. At 15, he joined the throngs of Irish pouring into the United States. He told our children stories of working on the docks and peddling newspapers in New York City before making his way west, succumbing to the lure of gold. Marcus Daly was ambitious, so it is not surprising that he soon became foreman at one of the Comstock Load silver mines in Virginia City, Nevada. Here he caught the eye of mining promoter George Hurst. The two men soon became friends. Now this was a friendship that would prove to be very valuable to Mr. Daly in the years to come. In 1876, as the nation focused on its centennial and the jolting defeat of George Armstrong Custer and his troops along the Little Bighorn River, Daly was sent to Butte, Montana to purchase a silver mine. Daly bought the Alice Mine, keeping an interest in it for himself. In 1881, he sold his interest in the Alice Mine and bought another silver mine, the Anaconda. With backing from his old friend George Hurst, Daly began to develop the Anaconda Mine. The mine's silver output was a disappointment. Then one day in 1882, the miners hit a huge vein of solid copper. Most miners in those days scoffed at copper. They wanted the more valuable silver and gold. Marcus Daly, however, was a shrewd businessman. He knew of new uses for copper in electrical and telegraph wires that would create an unprecedented demand for the red metal, all during a time when Thomas Edison was just completing the first electrical light power plant in New York City. The cost of processing copper was high because it had to be shipped to smelters in Wales. Daly knew that by reducing this cost, copper could be profitable. With this in mind, he approached Hearst and his associates to procure financing for a smelter. The smelter was built on a site west of Butte. The town of Anaconda was established to house smelter workers. It was a typical company town when Daly moved his family there from Butte. But eventually, Anaconda grew up around the smelter. With the smelter in place, Montana copper became competitive with that mined in Michigan, then the most productive in the world. The owners of the Michigan mines responded to Daly's new competition by dropping prices. Daly retaliated by increasing his production. The resulting copper war continued for almost two years. It thrust Marcus Daly into the international financial arena, making him a very rich man. When I married Marcus, he was working as mine foreman at the Emma Mine in Alta, Utah. Our first two children, Madge and Molly, were born there in Ophir. In 1876, we moved to Butte, Montana. Butte was a rough and tumble town built on the side of a mountain. Butte had steep, dirt streets that turned to mud when it rained. 
I was used to life in mining towns, ramshackle houses, saloons, street fights, and red light districts, all with the feeling that everything was temporary. None of this was new to me. However, I made a home in Butte for my family, and it was in Butte that our last two children, Marcus II and Hattie, were born. By the late 1880s, the hills around Butte and Anaconda were almost treeless. The tremendous need for timber in the mines and smelter had left them barren. Daly looked for a new source. In 1887, he began buying large tracts of land in the Bitterroot Valley. He built a sawmill along the Bitterroot River and established the town of Hamilton to serve the mill. The sawmill was completed in 1892. A year later, a light and power plant that could supply 10,000 people was added. The mill was the main employer of Hamilton, with most activities focusing around the mill. Marcus fell in love with the Bitterroot Valley. He was impressed with its farming possibilities. He also loved fine racehorses. Margaret, he said, I think the Bitterroot Valley would be a fine place to raise horses. We could build a horse farm and summer home there. While he was buying land for the sawmill in town, he also selected land for the ranch operation that included a stock farm devoted to his hobby of breeding and racing thoroughbred horses. Hamilton was Marcus Daly's town. Most of its residents were connected in some way to either the sawmill or the stock farm. People shopped at the company store. Daly established his own bank and newspaper. He even built a hotel to accommodate guests that he didn't have room for in his home. His carpenters built homes in the town for his employees and associates and Daly even paid his workers with gold coins. Daly also donated land for some of Hamilton's churches. The ranches were a self-contained operation. Businessman that he was, Marcus organized his farm into one of the most productive operations in the West. He supplied his company-owned grocery stores in both Hamilton and Anaconda with much of the produce grown on the farms. Altogether, the ranches and farms of the Bitterroot Stock Farm covered 22,000 acres. A main concentration of the ranches was the stock farm, devoted to the care and training of Marcus's beloved horses. Marcus was certain that the cool climate and high altitude of the Bitterroot Valley would produce a hardy horse. Marcus earned the respect and admiration of the racing world during his 14 years of competition. He wanted the best of everything for his horses. Oats grown on the ranch were shipped with the horses on the racing circuit. Marcus thought they were superior to oats grown elsewhere. He built a special horse stable for one of his favorite horses, Tammany. I remember him proclaiming that if Tammany won the 1894 Suburban Stakes in Gutenberg, New Jersey, he would build that horse a castle. Tammany won, and Marcus built Tammany Castle, a posh velvet-lined stall for his special horse. When Daly acquired his Bitterroot Valley Ranch property in 1886, it included a two-story, L-shaped farmhouse built by the original property owner, Anthony Chaffin. During Daly's lifetime, the original farmhouse was remodeled and expanded two times. The Daly's home later became known as Riverside. Riverside was once a classic Queen Anne style Victorian home with turrets and large porches. After Mr. Daly died in 1900, Riverside was remodeled one last time rather than being torn down. Since 1910, it's been a brick Georgian Revival style mansion with Grecian pillars gracing the front entrance. The beautiful mansion has over 42 rooms on three floors with 25 bedrooms, 15 bathrooms, and seven fireplaces. I 
think Marcus would be pleased with the way I managed his holdings after his death. He left me with good financial and legal advisors, and I felt up to most of the challenges that came my way. I continued to be a benefactor to the town. I donated land for the town library and even built a hospital as a memorial to my husband. Unfortunately, I was not comfortable running the racing operation after my husband's passing. I decided it was best to sell the horses. Auctions were held in Madison Square Garden in New York City to sell off the stock. By June of 1901, less than a year after my husband's death, all of the horses were gone. Now, at age 86, my family is my joy. I am pleased to have my daughter Molly and her husband, James Gerard, visit me often. My other daughter Hattie and her family live in Hungary. Europe is now so unstable with the war looming, I wish Hattie and her family would return to the United States. But she assures me that she, her husband Anton, and my granddaughter Margaret are safe. My other two children died very young. My daughter Madge succumbed to heart disease. Her two girls, my granddaughters, Margaret and Frances, are grown women now. My son, Marcus II, died while on a hunting trip in 1930. His son, Marcus III, came to live with me after his father's death. He was ten years old then. Today, he too is grown up and newly married. The one constant in my life has been Riverside, my beautiful summer home in the Bitterroot Valley. Each summer, our family spent as much time as we could at Riverside, arriving in early spring and leaving in late fall. It is a special place to relax and enjoy family and friends. At Riverside, there was always activity and noise, with laughter and happiness everywhere. Walking around the grounds, looking at the beautiful gardens, especially the rose gardens, and sitting in the sunroom swinging chair, are some favorite endeavors. Parties at Riverside were times of celebration, morning horseback rides, afternoons in the plunge, and fishing in our own lake, the duck pond, were enjoyed by everyone. The children especially loved our playhouse where their imaginations could soar. I am so glad that I started a house register, my guest book that all my visitors signed when they arrived. It helps me to remember my dear friends. My memories make me very happy, remembering each person and the time I shared with them here. I can't help but wonder, what will become of this place after I am gone? <laughs>